welcome to the Monopath podcast. I realise that I've never said anything about the introduction to this podcast, but the music is by me, Arthur Dove. Uh, the song is called LOL. You can find that music on YouTube, Spotify, all the usual places. So if you like it, go and give it a listen. It's on the website too, actually. Today I'm speaking with Rob Barraclough who's now releasing music under his own name, previously being in bands that some of my listeners will be aware of, more than you'll ever know, being the most recent of those. I think it'd be fair to categorise the large majority of Rob's creative output as pop punk. We do talk about some of the tropes of the genre and the dissonance between hard-cutting lyrics and the well-spirited music that pop punk usually generates as well as discussing rob's natural migration from one genre to another with his new project we spoke about having a mother tongue in songwriting which is having a a native instrument something that you fall back on or begin with when you're songwriting and what that is for rob as well as a few other things that are probably fairly thematic to the podcast at this point so genre stereotypes individual variants in your genre uh, intentions and consequences in art something i don't think i've discussed before but the difference between escapism and exploration of the self through anything creative as well as a whole number of other things we got quite into it i think Let's just say something about advertising in these things as well, uh, monetization. Uh, I don't want to do adverts if you don't want me to do them as well. You can support the podcast. You can simply share it with your friends. You can shop at Arthur Dove Tico, buy yourself some tea. That will help and we both get something out of that too. But if you feel like what you get from the podcast is enough, then by all means you can visit the support me tab at uh, arthurjohndove.com and contribute in that way. And last of all, I am now actively supporting and encouraging an association I have built with the Brain and Behaviour Foundation. Um, you can donate to them independently of me. I don't need any involvement with that whatsoever. I merely intend to draw your attention to their work. So... Let's dive into the conversation then, I think. Well, Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. The very first thing I wanted to start with was about your progression from doing pop punk music to what you're doing now. Was it a surprise to suddenly kind of change the music that you're producing? Did it happen intentfully or did it just happen? Probably a mix of the two. I think it's when I made kind of straight, more straightforward pop punk music, you're, you're in a band, so you've got four different opinions. Certainly in our band, like we all grew up on Blink-182, Green Day, Offspring <laughs> initially, and then latterly different bands that kind of progressed that sound, which we followed. And then the music that I'm making now, it was literally a case of, I think it was the first week of the lockdown. I took all my music stuff down to the garage. Hadn't really made music in four years, five years since my last band ended. And I just started recording whatever came out. So it didn't, it wasn't really a a purposeful thing, but I guess what I've listened, like I don't ordinarily listen to pop punk music now. I don't think I have on a, you know, like on a weekly basis for a long time. So I think it's just organic. Like it's just what I listen to now and it comes through. I have a very limited skill set. Like there's never going to be, a ton of variation even even songs that i've got now that are really electronic led it's still three chords a pretty similar melody um similar structures to the songs that kind of thing but um maybe just a bit broad a bit different um yeah so maybe we should do the formal introduction as well um maybe if you could mention your previous bands as well just for the sake of context for listeners that would be handy yeah i mean the last band that i was in was called more than 11 hour um that was the I mean, every band I've ever been in was within, with the same group of people. So the bass player, the guitarist and myself have always been the same since I was 14. Um, we were in a band called Left Side Open when we were kids. And then we grew into a band called The Aperture. 
again, the same people. And then we formed Morning Living Air, which was our last band, probably without doubt our best band. We did the most exciting things in that band. Um, but we always kept a similar sound throughout, which was, you know, that was still organic. It wasn't something that we were forcing because um, it was still the music that we loved. I think the difficult thing for me in that, like in the end, when we were sort of 24, 25, 26, was the scene that we ended up in. So we would play, like like I said, I was a 26-year-old man about to get married and that kind of thing. And you're you're playing gigs with, bands who are like these faux American and I get it like I appreciate that we sounded like a faux American pop punk band I get that but the attitude of people it was it was just too different to mine and I was just like it was so it felt like pretense in the end from a lot of people and it didn't really fit in with with what I felt we were necessarily we'd always get put on bills with these bands who were singing about California and beaches and all that stuff when you lived in Hunslet (laughs) not to steal Alex Turner's lyrics from him but um but we weren't that like I I was never I mean I was obviously the the lyricist in the band and all our songs like we had songs that were about domestic violence and you know things that were kind of and you're not to know that and you're not you know that's not saying it's better than a song that's not about that or you know that's about pizza and friends or whatever because they've got a place too but it always felt a bit like we were kind of shoehorned into that because we weren't a metal band and we weren't like a proper pop band. You know, we'd sort of fit in the middle and that seemed to be the middle bit. But it always felt a bit weird. Yeah, was it that the the attitude or there was an age difference and that meant that attitudes were just quite different between you guys and maybe some of the other people in the same network? Yeah, I mean, certainly an age thing, just kind of inherent in the kind of music that we played it's it's youthful and that's and it's simple so the when you're a young band the first thing that you do is go for the the thing that you can do so a lot of bands start in that territory and we would obviously play with a lot of bands that were younger than us but that was great i mean they they kind of reignited often some of the stuff like if we were playing the same venue that we played a hundred times or whatever it they were so excited it, it made it exciting and when they're running around and they're you know messing around it makes you remember why you were doing it initially but I mean we never got to any level I mean you know but we never got to any level where it was like it was big enough to be draining or we were doing enough for it to be draining anyway but it was sometimes nice to play with those younger bands but then I mean being a massive cynic anyway (laughs) spending a lot of time with those kind of kids you're like Jesus this is tiring (laughs) yeah I always I still find it strange when you hear people in like Blink-182 as a band I also grew up with singing the same kinds of songs like i still love that but the emotion yeah. that i feel i'm deriving from it is different to what i used to do i think when i was younger i was getting something novel whereas now i'm getting something nostalgic and it's quite odd because they're the same performers doing it and they've obviously aged and changed but they're still singing songs about kind of quite immature things which is is not really a mark of i'm not disregarding the quality at all there uh-huh. i'm just saying that there's that there's an oddness there is i mean maybe maybe that was the thing for you you just mentioned your own lyrics being about quite different things and it wasn't about california vibes and it wasn't about any of these sorts of things that blink 182 would write songs about that was already a bit of a there's a bit of a distance there between the lyrical content or the meanings then and the style of music because i always thought what like pop punk especially is a very vibrant uplifting genre so you don't necessarily yeah, expect yeah. to find lyrics that are kind of quite hard cutting was that something you ever intended to do or did, it, did that just happen as well yeah i did intend to do it like i've never been the kind of person i was never the kind of person just to kind of write something down like i was you just mentioned blink there like their latest album mark Hoppus was saying that they would just go in and like ad lib and then whatever they got they kind of there were the lyrics which obviously makes it difficult for a song to flow, which I've always been more careful to kind of sit and almost write it out as a piece. Um, So you don't just have a verse that means X and then a chorus that means Y and then a second verse that's not affiliated with either. I've always kind of tried to write a piece and then, you know, have that. Because especially in a band as well, like in our band, the guitar player would come up with a lot of the music. So then you would have like a piece of music that you could then put words to. Whereas now I can kind of build the pieces individual well together 
myself so it doesn't necessarily have to work like that and doesn't really work like that anymore for me but I still try and make sure that the songs have a definite meaning to me even those you I mean you heard our music plenty of times they're not necessarily that obvious to other people but I think it makes it easier as well because that kind of music the way that I sang in that band as well like was really everything was pushed and powerful and belted and I think it's hard to do that for the 20th time if you don't well, I don't understand how people do do that if the lyrics don't mean anything to them. Yeah, well, I mean, I can speak from my own experience of that. Like the, the lyrics for me, I guess they do mean something, but for the most of my writing, and I don't know, I don't know if I would really use the word career, but in all of the span of music that I've been a part of writing and the lyrics that I produced, probably ninety percent of that. I haven't even really been clear on what the lyrics have meant. And my way of writing lyrics was so difficult to achieve because of the way that I was doing it. And it wasn't coming from a point of, okay, this is what this song is about. So I'm just going to kind of slot some words into this pre-existing meaning. It was more like, okay, there's a feeling here and I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to add words that feel right. And that was quite a, I mean, I don't know if that even makes all that much sense if those two things seem any different from one another to you. But one of them, one of them to one of them, the difference being, I think, one of them, so the way that I have mostly written until recently, was just relying on pure intuition. And so it was fairly unconscious what I was writing. It just had that feeling of being right. And that was the only way that I was really getting through everything. So I kind of waded through the dark to get to some end meaning, even with Little Picture. So that was the first single I released as Arthur Dove. I was just fitting in words that kind of felt like they were right, but the meaning didn't really come together for me for a good few years after that. Whereas I get the feeling for you, you're more in kind of category B, which is that you kind of go into it with like, I think this song is about this. And so I'm going to write some lyrics that fit that and tell that story. Would that be, would that be fair? Yeah. I find it easier to do that. So I don't necessarily go in thinking I'm going to write a song about depression or I'm going to write a song about my relationship or whatever. But when you've written that first line, or you know, it's like, like you're in the shower and you get that line that's going to be the chorus or whatever. And then I'll extrapolate out from that but but with a meaning in mind, I find that easier, especially for verses. Like the new song that I'm releasing has got four verses and obviously I'm trying to make them fit a melodic structure and like a, a rhyming structure. And without that, I just feel like I would sit and be forever noodling around with things. And I do, yes. I mean, I do. P- please <laughs> don't get that wrong. I labor over things far too much, but um, but I find direction pretty useful. And also I think it helps tie it together for me like when I listen to a song like I can listen to songs like we had a song in Modern Love and Her called Where My Friends Are if I listen to that now it's relatively obvious what it's about anyway if I listen to it but it just takes me back to like 2011 when I wrote it I just feel mm. like that that person and I really like that I really like knowing what it was about listening to it even if it's a song that I've recorded 10 years ago and it never left my MacBook and then I put it on on iTunes it, rem- it reminds me of who I was and what I was going through and if I was really happy or if I was really sad or whatever. Um, and I really like that. The kind of, the lyrics carry me there. I appreciate music can do that without understanding the lyrics, but for me in my music, that's what I really value. And I think it's what I'm best at. Like I'm not, I'm not the greatest songwriter in the world. I'm certainly not the greatest guitar player, but thank God for logic and edits. But, but I really like kind of building, building pieces with words. I think it's, it's something that I'm at least passable at. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that always struck me for your the music that you've written. The, the lyrics always seemed quite important. Where music I've written, the lyrics are there, but they're not that important to me. I or They, they were less important uh, historically for me. Do you... Is that the thing when you're listening to music that you kind of gravitate towards the most? Is it... When you're hearing, say, a new piece of music, do you do the lyrics hit you first, or is it melody, or maybe something else? Yeah, I heard you say this in the last podcast. You said something about it being the shape of the words. So, like, and I think that's more me as a listener. So, like, I listen to 
like my favorite band in the world is Oasis, which de- deride it or otherwise, like Noel Gallagher's always talking about how he doesn't know. He's very similar to you by the sounds of it. Like he just writes and it's mm. wherever it comes from, it comes. And if it's a rhyming couplet that sits under another one, it means nothing to do with the previous one. It doesn't matter to him. And, but when I, when you listen to that music, you can pull meanings from it all over the shop and you can kind of pull the, the different verses and things together to form one meaning, even though they weren't intended. So I don't really listen to music looking for, I always find it a bit of a spoiler when you, when you've loved a song forever and then you find out what it was about and you're like, oh shit, I didn't, I didn't really think of that. Like you've ruined it for me. Yeah. I, th- I thought it was about me. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like being told how to perform a magic trick. Well, in the sense that if I'm part of the enjoyment that you derive from seeing magic performed yeah. is the not knowing it pulls how the it's mystery. performed and being duped in that way is actually, again, another way that you're kind of like spellbound by it. And I feel like with music, it's the same Absolutely. And like kind this, of this, thing. The same kind of thing. Like a lot of the, a lot of the bands that I listened to when I was younger, if I look back at the, maybe I was just younger and didn't, Maybe I liked the lyrics and I just had a different taste. But now when I look at some of them, like the early like Taking Back Sunday stuff or whatever, like I can still love those songs if I kind of switch off from the fact that, you know, what they're singing about. But, you know, the, the melodies will be kind of timeless, but I think that lyrics tend to date things quite a lot, especially when you write songs when you're in your adolescent period. A lot of, I mean, like a lot of our earlier songs, I still love them because we, they were, it was us learning how to write music, but we definitely did not know how to write about our feelings in a way that wasn't entirely overt or with awful metaphor. Like we had all, all sorts of metaphors about violence and things. It's like, I've never, I'm 32 and I've still never been violent. But I think sometimes, you, as you say, lyrics just appear to you. Nine times out of 10, they just, well, actually, no, I would say even every time lyrics for a song idea that you've got just seem to appear and take shape without uh, any precedent for that happening. So I think a lot of the time, the meanings of songs that people write can be quite uh, maybe against what they are naturally inclined to be like or to think about. So in your yeah. case, as you say, you're not a violent person, but uh, that's the only way that you can kind of explore violence. Um, yeah, I, I would like to say it was that deep. I think we were just 14 and listened to too much um, from first to last and that kind of thing. <laughs> we're trying well, to know what? That, at that age as well, that is probably when you are feeling the most violent or at least volatile is probably a more effective word to use to describe that because yeah. you've got these raging hormones and you're a bit bouncy all over the place. And it's understandable then that things like violence and would be manifest in the kind of the free unconscious words that spring into your mind when a musical idea happens to you. It seems yeah. like it's the same. In principle, there's something very similar to when people talk about why certain people play uh, computer games that have violence in them or watch movies like horror movies that are incredibly violent, but then they're nothing of the sort. And it's like, there's a, there's a need to sometimes explore your own emotions. And I don't think you know what you know until you've experienced something. Yeah. That makes well, sense. No, of course it does. That's the thing. I think that's the thing in general with, for, for me, music and for other people, art or film or whatever they might, they might create. It's a lot of the things that, I mean, I write about things, but not, like I said, I wrote a song about domestic violence. I've never experienced domestic violence, but like I, it's a, it was a thing that I thought was interesting to try and write something about. And like, I have a song on an EP that I put out earlier in the year, which was about, Caroline Flack of all things like and I, I've never followed her work I don't know anything about her or I didn't know anything about her but when she killed herself I thought that would take a foray into trying to write about that kind of thing and it was it was interesting because it, it was something that I wasn't just I mean I'm a happily married 32 year old man with two kids like there isn't a huge amount that I'm mad about and not sad about anything <laughs> so I like I like to use that to explore so 
and I'm sure that's what other people do with their art. Like you don't necessarily write about literal things or things that you're experiencing or plan on experiencing. It sounds like then, and maybe you could correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but a lot of the creation that you, well, the things that you're writing about and the art that you're creating, they're almost kind of reifications of who you are at a certain point in time. Do you think that's something that you could uh, make a generalization for people who are creating something? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think there are certain artists, I mean, throughout history that are clearly tortured souls and write very kind of explicit music about themselves. And it's because they're going through those things. I've always been remarkably lucky in life anyway. Like I have, you know, I've had always had great family, great friends. I've never really been through anything that would be, that would allow me to write anything, you know, and moan about my own life because it's just not, never been in that place. So I think it's really good to, I mean, it helps you explore and it helps you empathize as well. Like I've lived with people who've had depression and things. I've never had it, but I've, the, the a lot of the stuff in the, in the latest song that I'm going to release is, is about that kind of thing, you know, wanting to be more than yourself and not being able to get out from within your, your own skin, which again, I mean, anyone that, that knows me, I'm not, that's not how I am at all. So it's more of a kind of story about someone else, if you like. Yeah, it does sound like there's some overlap between what you're doing with your music and what actors do with their characters, which is to kind of try out being somebody else for a short period of time and to kind of imagine what that is like. I spoke to my brother on the podcast, uh, I suppose by the time this podcast is available and people are listening to this now, that will have aired as well. So it's the podcast with my brother, Jamie, and he is an actor and he was kind of, he was talking about sympathy and empathy and he was saying how he, he either, he does one or the other with characters and if he's sympathizing with them what he's saying is that he's he's not really sure he he doesn't think he's ever felt the same thing that they have felt so maybe in this case something like depression or domestic violence but he can he can almost kind of intellectualize it and and imagine what it would be like or he's got like a proxy feeling or a set of feelings that he thinks okay i imagine i would feel this set of feelings so i'm going to feel them and talk about it and play it that way when he's empathizing sure. with it, it's a little different because that's with feelings that you might already know. So for example, yeah. if you're, if you were to empathize with a character who's been a product of domestic violence, then you have experienced domestic violence. You could empathize with them. You can feel the same feelings. If you haven't yeah. experienced domestic violence, then you can't empathize with them, but you can sympathize with them instead. What do you yeah. think of the role of those two things? So sympathy and empathy in songwriting. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. I've never, really, I mean, I've I've never even really told people what songs are about before. So the, I suppose the danger in that, certainly with songwriting, is the sympathising element is that you could massively misconstrue how it might feel or what the experience might be like, and you might write a song that you think is a really good depiction of that experience, but actually you've completely um, misread it and written something that's either offensively bad or it's something that's just gets the turn wrong or whatever. Whereas empathizing, like obviously I've I've like everyone, ninety percent of my songs are about love or breakups or whatever. So you can assimilate feelings, you can empathize, and you can say, Oh, I, well, I haven't had a heartbreak in a long time, but last time I did, this is how it felt. Um, which is the thing, like I've written songs about like whether I've got friends in relationships or whether I had friends who've gone through breakups. That's where I kind of pull a lot of that from now. So if I have friends who struggle with certain things and they talk to me about it obviously not explicitly mentioning names in songs and things, but I I can pull from that. And that's where the empathy element comes in for me. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's not really a concept I've ever thought of before he had mentioned it, but I, and I certainly hadn't kind of joined the dots between what he's doing as a character actor in theater productions and what maybe you or I would do in songs. I have a distinct memory of, when I was recording Hound on the Hunt, which was the third single I put out last, and I put that out last year, that was a character piece. Like I wasn't, I was playing somebody in that and I didn't know who that somebody was, but there was a very specific place 
Uh, and I mean a cognitive place. There was a state of mind that I had to go in and a, almost a posture shift in me when I was performing that. And that still follows into how I'm performing it now when I do. It, I'm, I feel like a character when I'm performing that song because it's so... I don't know if you're... Are you familiar with that uh, song of mine? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a you bit, it's a bit creepy and... I mean, there's, again, that's another one where there's not so much of a direct meaning to it, it quite loosely. There's something about, it, it's being quite bestial and aggressive towards other people for your own end. Yeah. Um. So being quite willing to do whatever you need to do at other people's expenses to get far and to get ahead. It's something like that. But I can't feel, I can't. That's just not something I can empathize with at all. So I have to sympathize with it and play this kind of character part. And so I'm shifting my body when I was when I was singing it and recording it. I had to kind of shift my body into a certain way and look a certain way, like a fixed glare. And it was quite a strange experience. And it worked, but it was strange. Yeah, it does. I mean, I've I've done that with a few, like the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, but like I have a song that's incredibly dancey that sounds nothing like anything I've ever made before and that's kind of like this dance floor I mean the lyrics are literally about me on a dance floor and but it feels like that kind of thing it feels like really effervescent and and again I'm not a dancer I'm not against having a good time but and then when I was recording that I was recording the vocals I was dancing around the booth that I was recording it in and kind of because the, the lyrics are about being promiscuous and things again something that I've never mm. really been <laughs> and but it's, you know, it feels, I think it feels good to explore those different things as well. And it's, you know, it helps you explore them in an, an environment that's, that's yours. Is there an element of escapism in it for you when you're writing music? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's not necessarily required escapism. Uh, I get, I've got a pretty, um, you know, I've got a nice a life with a, a broad range of different things that feed into it. But I I do... I think that's the thing for any creative person. I mean, one of the things I didn't write anything for like four years, like I said earlier, I didn't really even play guitar that much. That was inherent with having two little kids who wake up at five, nap twice a day, go to bed at six. There's not a lot of space in the day to make noise. But when I could again, and I realized I was missing that opportunity and I wasn't really, you know, I would go out and do things other than making music. I started to feel like you spent all this time building up this whatever level of skill set I've got, I've got a skill set. You spend all this time building that skill set up. You have this thing that is a lot of people would kind of really like to have. And I wasn't using it because, you know, I, I don't know if you feel like this, but I don't mean this in a derogatory sense at all. But obviously most people that you meet don't record their own music. They don't make their own art. They don't, they, they go to work, they come home, they watch the TV, they go to bed and most people live in that kind of mechanism and I live in that mechanism for the most part, but this makes me feel like I'm kind of, I'm able to, to do things that most people are not able to do, whether that's through skill or will. I think it's probably more will than skill, but I, I really like that that's kind of come back into my life and can act as escapism, even if it's literal escapism. Like I, my recording stuff is now in a little room under our house and it, I only go in there like maybe twice or three times a week for an hour a time when I've got time, when my kids are in bed. But it's just me in this little cocoon and I can be anything. And I record all sorts of stuff that people will never, ever hear, whether it's just like little vocal lines that, you know, are just too ridiculous to show to other people or the music's just too far one way or it's terrible. It is the more frequent occurrence. But, but I love that. Like that's such a, a great thing to be able to do. I remember going on holiday a few years ago and having a conversation with my fiance D and we were talking about the difference between escapism and exploration. My attitude probably hasn't changed in the definitions of the two things and maybe, but maybe it does change how I'm thinking about the word right now. I always thought escapism was like having a holiday from yourself. And when people went on holiday and just literally wanted to do absolutely nothing and just kind of escape from reality and just kind of, dine out on everything pleasurable that was that was escapism and that's that's not necessarily i can appreciate why people would do that i have done that but 
I have that as a feature of my of my holiday experience where I go on holiday to, as an exploration of myself instead rather than trying to escape from myself. I'm, I'm trying to explore myself. So I want to go there to a different country, say, and try as many new things as I possibly can. That's the virtue of going to a different country sometimes with a different culture is every single thing in the environment is completely novel to you. There's sure. no... There's no common ground to grasp onto. I mean, the last holiday I had abroad was in Thailand and it was very much the case where everything was different. And for somebody who is looking to explore themselves, having all these new triggers were crucial to better exploration. Whereas if I had been going to escape from myself, that would have been useful. Uh, sorry, useless. There would be no point in any of those things because escapism to me in that regard is kind of almost like closing your eyes in a crowded room and just pretending you're not there anymore rather than embracing it and speaking to all of the people in the room. So I guess the only reason I make those points and, and try to clarify that is perhaps, yeah, I don't know if you are really an escapist in, in that yeah. sense. I think it's more of an exploration. I mean, I'm terrible. I mean, my wife would tell you this and anyone that's spent a significant amount of time in my company. Like I, I suck. Like you just said, if you, I, I would never ever want to just sit and stare into the distance for three hours. Like as escapism, that would be useless for me because I get bored. I have to, I can't really do passive anything like sitting and watching TV unless it's gripping. It's just not my thing. Like I need to be involved in it, whatever it is. Like I'm, mm. I like working out and things and that I like, that takes up some of my time and making music where you feel like, there's a product at the end of it almost, which I know sounds stupid because a lot of people will just enjoy relaxing for relaxation's sake, which maybe I should do more, but I'm terrible at that. And my, you know, I have a very busy life and I think that's good for someone like me. Like I, maybe I've built it that way on purpose now, but um, I don't really get time anymore, quote unquote, get time to escape from things. And I think I enjoy that way more. Like, Yeah, I, um, I have uh, like, I... I use the term focused procrastination or targeted procrastination <laughs> because I I do procrastinate and I do use escapism, but I couldn't have a extended period of it. As you were saying, I can sit down and watch TV, let's say for an hour and I'm sick to the teeth of it. And I have to leave and do something else. I can't just stay there. Whereas uh, D can, D is more comfortable in front of the TV and, that's... And just doing work and staying there. I just, yeah, I, I, I really, what you said really resonated me with when you said that it could be quite difficult to be around you because I, I have, I I, I do genuinely feel like I've driven some people away from me because I'm so difficult to be around because I'm just so focused on doing things and producing something all yeah. of the time. It's, it's quite difficult for somebody to be around. Well, I, and I, and I certainly have, like I've grown far more mellow as I've got older through various different avenues. But I also, I don't really care. Like I care, like if you, if you want to be close to someone, then you've got to be close to them for without sound like a American team movie, you've got to be like who, who they are. Like that's, and that is what I'm like. Like I'm a bit high maintenance with things. And I like to, one of the things that my parents kind of hear about me sometimes is that I think too much. I know, I mean, you certainly think a lot given that you're a philosopher but like my one of the things my dad always says to me is like don't worry about it I'm like i'm not worried about it i'm just thinking about it there's a massive difference there and totally. uh he just doesn't understand that like he's he's like well you can't change it but i'm not saying i can change it i just want to understand it and if i can't understand it then fine and if i can maybe i can speak to someone else and change their opinion on it or whatever, which obviously is difficult to be around sometimes when you just want to have a conversation about something and you don't want someone trying to turn it into a, a discussion, you know, which is probably more people than not, I imagine. Absolutely. I I love, I, I mean, I get more out of trying to understand things on some kind of, on their fundamental principles. That's why I do. That's why I study philosophy and I study philosophy in part because I, I didn't really know what I was doing with music and I wanted to get better at communicating some of those things. Um, I just think communication is kind of crucial for development really. But yeah, in most cases I tend to 
over intellectualize things that most people take for granted but that as i say is the job of a philosopher somebody mentioned on a uh, that was on an earlier podcast actually about the differences be- between um well thinking or overthinking and uh, overthinking is usually used as a slur as it probably was in the case you're laying out there which is that you're overthinking which implies that you're doing too much of thinking about something you needn't uh i don't always feel like i'm I do that, but you, as you said, you, you're not really worrying, and I'm not. I guess the difference is there is with worry, that carries some emotional valence to it, and it means yeah, and sometimes that you have I am. some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But the the thinking is it's not parallel with worrying. There's no proportional relationship between those two conditions. I, if I worry, it's completely separable from whether I'm thinking about it or not. Yeah. They're just different states of mind. And I tend to not worry about really anything. I'm I'm very laid back and I'm not neurotic in the slightest. I'm, I've got more and more laid back as I've got older. But I do think a lot about absolutely everything all of the time. And so I have my interests and I just, I follow them and it sometimes gets me into trouble. <laughs> but yeah. hey ho. You can just end up kind of, I mean, one of the things that's weird with that is People say stop overthinking things or don't worry about it or it won't, it doesn't matter. And then I tend to get super drastic and be like, well, nothing matters. I mean, depending on your stance on, <laughs> on rebirth and things. But like, as an, I'm an atheist, I'm not a militant one, but I, I'm like, well, if you want to go like there, nothing matters. Stop worrying about your job. Stop worrying about your life. Stop worrying about your kids. No, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? So <laughs> allow me to say my piece. That's, that's, no, why, well, that's why I'm difficult to be around. <laughs> that right there. Yeah, I, I'm just very, my, my auntie, who I'm quite close with, had, she has uh, chickens and hens and such, and one of them got uh, taken by a fox yesterday, and she was quite upset, and so I was having a conversation with her just through, uh, just in text, but I said, listen, I'm not very good at comfort, and I'm not very good at giving you the sort of words you might feel like you need now, and she said, no, actually, sometimes I just need a factual view of things to kind of ground me and take the emotions out of it. And that's something that you're better at doing than I am. And I thought, well, yeah, that is how I I kind of approach things. And I think a lot of the experiences that I have with people who are feeling a little bit more emotional, I don't use that as a derogatory term whatsoever. It's not a pejorative. It's Emotions are absolutely, well, they're essential. So <laughs> it'd be very, very strange to have a problem with the emotions. But when people get most frustrated with me is when I'm not re-emphasizing their emotions in my own behavior. And I don't, I don't tend to spend much time reflecting what other people are doing. And that's a skill I've, I've developed because, you know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit odd anyway. So I don't naturally Riola. have that built into me. I think a lot of people have this uh, gift to be able to empathize with everything and and be as emotional as another person and to take up these kind of cues in the social world that I don't, I don't think I have that. I don't have that gift. I've had to kind of develop it as a skill. Um, in any case, uh, I guess that... I'm just giving, I'm self-therapizing. <laughs> well, I can, I can add to it briefly if I can. Cause I, yes, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm empathetic cause I've had kids. I've certainly grown more empathetic. I've always been very like sensitive as a person anyway, which sounds at odds with what I was just saying, but it's not necessarily, but I'm the same. Like in a, I, I can't stand people who self-sabotage repeatedly and then want you to comfort them. I'm far more of a, well, you did this and it led to this. So let's try a different Avenue next time when people with everything in life, like if people want to improve something or they want whether they want more money or a better body or they want to get better at something and they're doing nothing towards it and just want sympathy. I just, I find that very difficult to, to be, well, to be sympathetic about. I tend to give a too honest an opinion. In moral philosophy, you have these two terms. You have utilitarianism and you have deontology. I don't know if you will have heard of those before because they're quite niche philosophy terms, but utilitarianism, sorry, difficult word to say, but utilitarianism is it? It's utility-based ethics, which utility is in, it's a term they use in economics for kind of 
the it represents like the total improvement of well-being for a group of people. And sometimes that jars with deontology, which is more like it, it's more like a moral urge that we have uh, deontology being duty-based ethics, which is that kind of drive to do the right thing. Uh, and those two philosophical principles clash quite often. And in entertainment, in movies that we watch and in games that we play, these sorts of things and plays and whatnot, even in, our, in most kinds of art, they clash and they're really interesting. I mean, I don't know if I've explained those two terms clearly enough, so maybe I could give you an ex an example, there's a famous ex thought experiment called the trolley problem, which is a uh, by a philosopher called Philippa Foot, and she wrote that if you imagine there's a trolley on a set of tracks, and it's heading towards uh, a, a group of people, there's five people on the tracks, and it's going to kill them unless you can make this trolley get out of the way, and the only way that you can stop that is by pushing somebody in well, in the way. The the question there being, what is right? Is it right to kill one person to save five? Or is it right to let the five die so that you don't kill the one person? The, yeah. the utilitarianism one would be to save the most people. So it would be the option where you, you kill the person to save five. The deontological point would be to do the opposite, which would be because it's morally wrong to kill somebody, you shouldn't do it. You should let the five people die. So those two ethical principles clash, uh, clash, and the reason that I bring them up is because the the duty based ethics they have that emotional valence to them where utilitarianism does not. It's like it's a calculus, really. You're kind of making like a moral calculation and going, but five deaths is worse than one, so I should do that. Yeah, but that's not an emotional. That's not an emotional consideration. That's a that's entirely. A priority it's rationalized in the in the head and i'm in that group of people i wouldn't really identify as a utilitarianist but I, it sounds I'm severe certainly it? it sounds severe yeah I, I i can appreciate both of those sides and I, I don't think you really find i don't think you, you probably do find people who are on both sides of it but i'm in terms of my mindset i'm more of a utilitarianism kind of mindset i i rationalize and i care about total well-being and overall effect and consequences rather than intentions generally yeah that's how i think well it is it's uh, it's more outcome based isn't it which is that yeah that like when i was saying when people want to make a change but then rather than looking at the outcome and doing whatever they can to get there they excuse themselves in any way possible i, I find that frustrating and hell i do it all the time but <laughs> I'm a hypocrite like everyone. So, Yeah, well, people get stuck on their intentions, I think, a little bit. So, I mean, utilitarianism is a kind of consequentialism, which means it is kind of obsessed with the consequences and the outcomes of events rather than the intentions that go into them. And deontology is a kind of, maybe you could say intentionalism, which is like it's just about the intentions. And it's like when you see like a a, a public debate about whether something is right or wrong to do or whether we should or shouldn't do something, you can you can see these two principles competing sometimes and people will, you can see on one side of it saying, this is the right thing to do, we should do this. And actually, it, in culture now, I now since studying it for philosophy, I see it all the time and think, you can see people doing behaviours that feel as if they are right, but actually don't lead to right outcomes. Yeah. Uh, all, all of the time. You, you see things like that. Um, a, a good example, and maybe this one, maybe this doesn't go down uh, as I'd like, but it, it, I, it, when I saw people, in fact, I'll preempt this just by clarifying that, like, I support the NHS. My, I have family and lots of friends who work for the NHS. Uh, I've used the NHS a lot, and they've helped me through a tumor in my leg. So I am obviously supporting the NHS despite making this statement. But when people were clapping for the NHS every single week after about two months of doing that it just seemed like that was a performative gesture that served no real great outcome entirely, um, whereas entirely. I'm about outcomes so if I want to celebrate the NHS then my my attitude to it is well what we should do is we should make sure that the NHS are funded appropriately 
And we should make sure that people who avoid paying their taxes, like large organizations, pay their taxes. Like, so that would be the difference between something that's about intentions and consequences there. I don't see the, I don't see the, I don't see the performative gesture of clapping hands after week seven as a very helpful one where I would prefer people went and were more active in their kind of disdain for people who don't pay their rather large tax bills. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's all, there was, listen, a lot of people did that with good intentions. Fine. I didn't partake, mm-hmm. but it became it became performative and it also became competitive. There were people, I can clap louder than you because I care about the NHS more. And certainly from what I've seen, partially because of where I live and some people that I know, they're the same people who are clapping really loudly every week for the NHS are also dead against the immigration that largely underpins the NHS, certainly in a lot of frontline circumstances. And it was just like, I mean, maybe I've taken it off onto a political standpoint there and I shouldn't have done, but... It, I think I might have done that. It drives me. Sorry. I I could do the I could do that all all year. Let's not do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, all I was really I I, I guess I was just interested on on the grounds of it, of how that applies to music, and we did go off on a tangent, but it was a, it's a fun tangent sometimes. And I think with intentions and consequences, then the point that I wanted to the way to get that back into music is we had already spoken about your intentions when it comes to lyric writing. Uh, how close do you think the consequences are in that case? Does your intention going into writing a song lead to the consequence that you want or does it go somewhere new and different? Yeah, well, what what I found recently in the, maybe even the last sort of, I don't, let's say five songs that I've written, because I write them very piecemeal in logic. So I'll, I will build them up and I'll build the music and I'll have lyrics in mind. And then when I go and record, and I'll often record a full song of lyrics and then be like, now now they're kind of pieced together. It doesn't really fit as well as it could. So then I'll the, the consequence of, of what I actually wanted is that's not really what I thought it'd end up being. And then I go away and or what I'll tend to do then is just mute the vocal track, play the track and just top line over it. And then when I get a line that I like, I, can then, I then kind of rebuild the song around that, which I think is really interesting because it's like... It, it's almost like writing the song twice, which I feel like leads to a better outcome because I've disregarded something that mustn't have been good enough somehow. But obviously that's mm. massively subjective and you could show two people the two different songs or two different lyric and melody sets and they might like completely different ones. But but I found that really interesting because I've done that with loads of songs recently. I think it's more having more time because it's in my it's in my house so I can... It's not like I've rented a studio and gone through and recorded vocals and then gone, right, I don't like them and I've got to pay more money to do whatever, which always always strangles things anyway, but I guess that's reality. I can just kind of mess with songs forever. Like one of the things that Liam said on, was it your first podcast, I think? He, that was the first podcast with uh, Woes and Wonder, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Woes and Wonder. I wish he'd stop with all the monikers. Anyway, um, like he was saying that he never really knows when stuff's finished and like he'll, it's like, when do I actually put this out? And I've, I wouldn't even say struggled with that. I've really enjoyed that. Like you just get to mess around and noodle for ages. And then you put some, like I was listening back to my, the EP that I put out the other day and there's one remarkably bum note in the first verse of the first song. And I was like, how did I not spot that? You didn't, you didn't noodle with it enough, but but I also over noodle and end up sounding like a robot on the song. So I definitely try and you know, pull that in a little bit. How do you know when to break off and say, this is job done? I think the cycle that my songs go in is I'll build them and build them and build them and add too many guitar parts and synthesizers and strings to every chorus ever and a million harmonies. Then listen to it and be like, this is wonderful. This is Phil Spector times 10 listen to it the day after and be like, what is that? It's too much. Strip it back down again. And then it's finished pretty much. So most of the songs, like you alluded at the beginning to like moving away from the pop punk thing. But I think most of the songs are fundamentally, it just depends how you define that. Cause you can define it as kind of the antiseptic, like Americanized, homogenized power chord. Just doesn't, there's no dynamics to it, that kind of thing, which mm. I don't think I fall into. But the songs fundamentally are like three chords, happy melodies, and um, pretty basic structures. And that's where they end up getting to at the end. So, like a lot of those songs did have all sorts of stuff in them, and then you bring them back down again and go, 
but it sounds better like this. More doesn't always mean better, which you should discover, I think, a bit earlier in your musician journey, but here we are. Yeah, I wonder if with a musical journey, which I quite like the idea of it being a journey, is as you're kind of developing as a musician, whether you begin with stereotypes. So in most case, or at your case at least, you might begin with a genre and say, okay, we're pop punk. And it's a bit more kind of classic pop punk. And as your skill develops and you progress as a musician, it becomes a bit more idiosyncratic than it was before. And you start, it's almost as if you've got toggles and dials on the genre that you can kind of crank up this feature and cut this feature. And that's what makes it more of a personal journey. Yeah. Like that's, for you. that's absolutely it. Like you, it's, it's like having a, a plugin and you've got, all the little knobs and you can just get rid of the over Americanized aspects. You can get rid of the, you know, the limitations around instrumentation and stuff. Like I, I still listen to, to pop punk music, but it's more like I listen to bands and you may not have heard of them. I'm not trying to sound cool, but like there's a band called Pentimento who are a pop punk band, but the it's big, like lush open chords. Nothing ever sounds closed. The drums are kind of, you know, they're not the really snappy overproduced drums. And I really like that. And like the Menzingers and stuff like that where it's really, it sounds really organic, but it's still fundamentally a pretty simple pop punk song. Like you put All Time Low's producer on it, you put Mark Hoppus on produ- production duty, isn't it sound like All Time Low? But yeah. yeah. So I don't know if it's necessarily even a difference in songwriting. It's just a difference in letting some some strings ring out. You don't always have to have the, the root note and the fifth, you know what I mean? How is it you're making your music sound organic in that case? Because something like, something like the music, the style of music or the genre that most people would pigeonhole you into, that's got a very certain style of production, as you say, which yeah. can make it seem less dynamic and uh, less organic in some cases. So how are you kind of creating that or, or maintaining that uh, genuinity in that? Yeah, I, well, I mean, A, I don't know if I'm being successful in doing that at all anyway, but I'm... I'm I have no skills in terms of production. I've never learned anything. I mean, after I recorded my first EP, I asked Will, who's our mutual friend, what a compressor was actually meant to do and what I should actually do with the knobs. So I'd recorded an EP, put it on Spotify, and then thought, I should really learn what this compressor thing does. So just a bit of prefacing. But that helps as well. Because without that, some of those songs, that like, um, there's a song called You Never Know The Last Time, which is, I think it's really like, for a pop punk song, let's always clarify that, but... It's quite soulful and it's got quite a lot of, like the, there's a bridge vocal that's a really powerful, like big belted line, but I did it on the first take and I never, I never tuned it and I never changed it, which is kind of rare for that genre of music, but it just felt like I was, I mean, I didn't, you know, like I said, that song's not about me, but, but it felt right and it sounds like it felt right. I mean, I sung it and I'm listening to it, so I don't know if it feels like that to other people, but it always felt really powerful that. So I try not to over, like I will tend to over process the vocals and then like rewind it and pull the tuning off and stuff and let it sound like somebody actually singing, which is pretty rare in that genre. As well with, in terms of guitars and things, I never play power chords, like everything's open chords always, which creates a bit of mud sometimes, but in the mix, I mean, not literally. Um, but I think it sounds, it just sounds better. We always did that. We learned that. We were discussing Ronnie before this, the producer that produced some of our music previously. I learned that from him. Like he he kind of took us out of a little pigeonhole and was like, try using chords. <laughs> yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a power chord. And, uh, and I do that in everything. I mean, most of the songs that you'll ever hear me play and our, our best songs in any of our previous bands were always in E because you can have like the big open E into a big open B, big open A big up in C sharp like you and you can just build the song around that and you've always got the B and the E string open at the bottom and it just creates this really nice I just love the sound of songs in that key I just can't quite sing in it so there's a bit of a conflict there yeah it's funny as well do you write all of your songs on guitar um I always did until I mean the the song that I'm going to put out at the end of July I started just with three piano chords which are literally looped throughout the entire song i mean that it's not a piano sound that's associated with it it's a synth laid on top of an organ but it's that was the first song that i ever kind of stepped outside of because even if songs don't end up being predominantly guitar that's the thing that i'm sat on the sofa with all the time that's the thing that i'm sat in the room with do you know what i mean so that's that's it seems more natural and i can't play piano like i can if i go 
I'm in Noodle and it might sound good and I'm like, right, remember that bit. But ordinarily I'll be transposing from guitar, literally note by note, like what does a C major look like? And pulling it from the guitar and placing my fingers until it sounds right. Which is good as well because that helps with creativity. Like you hit some, I'm sure I'm not finding undiscovered things, but it it helps you do things outside of the book. Whereas on a guitar, I'm kind of a bit limited because I know what I'm doing to an extent. Yeah, it's a question of what your mother tongue is, I think. People have used the word language to describe these things I have as well. And it's like your mother tongue is, well, English and guitar. So when you're writing music, your mother tongue is guitar. So you might be able to transpose guitar into another language, say by putting it on piano, but it's always kind of from the standpoint of guitar work rather than the other way around. Uh, I was going to ask with with that spirit in mind, whether you gravitate towards different uh, variables, really. Maybe that's keys or chords that you use when you're on one instrument or another. Yeah. Oh, I mean, most songs that I write now seem to start out in G because I spent that long in the last... I said I didn't play music for four years, but it was kind of when I discovered Oasis properly <laughs> because I thought I'd be very late to the party. Why not? And every Oasis song, as everyone knows, is in the same key. And I, So now when I'm sat and I noodle, my fingers just go to G, D, A minor, E minor, C. So I tend to write everything there. And then I'll just transpose it up and down because it's another key that I find tricky to sing in. There are key, It's funny because there are some keys that I can sing. A lot of the, my solo stuff is much more gentle singing. And there are some keys that I find I can sound really nice singing gently but then I can't belt in that key and there are other keys that I can belt in and it sounds great but then when I try and pull it down for the verse my voice is just doesn't sound right it's too pitchy in that key but I have a few that I go to I don't know if it's too boring to tell you the, the ones that I end up with no no I find it interesting well it's good enough for me yeah I mean B and C sharp as the major keys tend to work the best for my voice so I don't know why that is I mean they feel lower but that's because I like I said I always used to gravitate to sort of, I mean, I ended up in the E flat major, but that's because we played half a step down. But yeah, it's because I couldn't sing in E, evidently. <laughs> yeah, I know I do the same thing more or less. I, when I'm on, in fact, when I'm on both now, I so I have a, a acoustic guitar that I got set up and tuned down into B. Right. So it's very low. It's like a fifth lower. Yeah. Um, but I naturally just find that I I write music at there anyway. So how does that feel when I sit, I don't know. I like the, the fullness that I get from it because I'm playing one instrument and it's just me on my own. I feel like when I'm playing on an, on an acoustic guitar, that's tuned so much lower. It's just got some of that body that's lacking from playing it in the higher, in the higher tuning. Same with piano. Really? I, I, I always, if I sit down at the piano, my starting point is usually around the middle of the piano but if B minor or B major, and I'm somewhere around there pretty much universally. And most of my songs end up that way. The only time that they haven't ended up that way is if for some reason, a very specific idea strikes me and I've already got this idea clear in my head and I'm trying to take that and put it on the piano or put it on to a guitar. Then they end up somewhere else. But if I'm going to noodle or if I'm just working from scratch and I've not come into it with any pre-existing ideas about where i'm going to end up i'm straight to be pretty much all the time yeah um, and i think the thing is i think that you have a well not you but i have a bit of an anxiety about that like i start writing a song and i'm like we well, can't have another one in this key then i'm like well a you're not ellen john calm down no one's <laughs> no one's gonna check back through your back catalog mentally because not so many people have heard it but also especially now I just write music to be like I wrote another song recently that sounds very much like two of the ones of the four on the EP and I but I just went with it because it just felt good and I'm not really doing it for any reason other than to be able to use the the like I said earlier the skill set that I've got and just do something that makes me feel good and so I kind of I always had that anxiety you know that in especially in the bands that we were in we were always like oh does it sound too much like this too much like that which is such a weird mm. thing that always, that was always a frustration of mine as well. Like, and I always said this and I'm sure it frustrated them, but like no one's listening that closely. Like you play a gig to a hundred yeah. people, four will check you out afterwards, which is great Four more than, you know, and I valued every one of them, but we're here because we enjoy playing music in the room together. 
and ultimately that's that's it like we were far better than plenty of bands far worse than plenty of others but we enjoyed it and i didn't really ever see why there was a focus yeah on that. I, now that you mention it i wonder if that's something that you just end up learning and i know what in the things that i've read about learning anyway is like things tend to start out innate and you've just got this feeling that it's right when you're kind of deciding whether whether it's music and or art or something else you start off with this feeling of okay this feels right this chord progression feels right i can't explain why it just does at some point when you're developing that skill you get to an ability way ability level where you can say it's right because and because x and you can fill in x with whatever information is relevant to that uh, decision at some point after that it feeds back that that skill feeds back into your intuitions and so it's almost like you internalize uh, some of the some of the rationalizations of the skills that you've got yeah um i can make that make more sense in music i've i, I want to compare music and tea actually is what, so the two of the things that i'm really focusing on at the moment with music i began very like young at like 15 i started playing music and it, i just did things because they felt right at the time i went and got a degree in it so i got these skills and i could explain what key things were in and uh, you know i could get into some of the theory of of the music that i was writing and, and then i went to produce it so i could talk about it in terms of its sonic qualities so what frequencies they're doing this and that and where they should be in a mix and at some point after that when i was performing my intuitions changed because I had studied what frequencies were right for, say, a bass guitar. So I didn't need to think about it anymore. I just knew instinctively how to pitch a bass and how to EQ a bass guitar. And so I was playing a certain way with that in mind unconsciously. Does that progression kind of make sense to you as well yeah it does i mean not the the technical aspects of it because if i knew how to eq a bass guitar we would be much further along in the journey <laughs> but um i'm learning right i'm that's one of my things at the minute like i'm spending as many hours as i can learning how to actually do the thing that i'm trying to do um but yeah completely like the one, one thing that i find with that is as you learn more seems to be a thing in like your mid-20s i don't know you learn more and you start like i started listening far more in my early 20s to to John Mayer and people like that who did things that were so different to what I was doing. And then the last 10 years, mm. the music that I've been listening to is like Jackson Brown, Crosby, Stills and Nash, the Eagles, Joni Mitchell. That's what, if you look on my Spotify, that's what I listen to every day. So then you go through a period of like, well, I need to sound like that. I must need to make music like that. And I don't know why that, where that comes from. Like I can't listen to this and not make it. And then you make it and it's, in my case undoubtedly terrible and then because i had time off even though the first song that i wrote when i started making music again was exactly the same as it was the same chords and this near enough the same melody as one of the morning live and earth songs it felt right i was like oh this is what you're good at do this no matter, like it doesn't matter if it's credible or whatever the right word is like chasing that was yeah. always yeah so i mean i don't do that you've probably had that You've probably had that skill development journey somewhere else, though, because it's a fairly universal quality about people. Um, I mean, parenting, maybe, for example, is a is something that you found that where at some point you might have read a book about parenting or something or kind of Googled a problem. I don't know. I um, I live with my wife who tends like she teaches me everything about parenting because she somehow knows it. I don't know. That must be an in some people. I just follow. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I have. I'm lo I'm really lucky. I have like I have a good career, and I've learned a ton of stuff in in my field there. You know, through making a ton of mistakes as well. But absolutely, like you develop in uh, yeah, I guess different ways. I'm using terms like learning, but really, what I'm talking about is there's something there with like habits and and routine. And at some point, if you've got a routine, or if you're setting up a routine, when you first set it up, it takes some conscious effort to set it up, but eventually, it becomes routine. And you don't even have to think about it anymore. So a common example is the drive to work. When you first set off on the drive to work that you've never been to before, you have to really be conscious of where you're going and what you're doing. But after a year of doing that journey, you don't even remember it. Yeah. And that's the perfect analog for what's happening when you pick up a skill. I said I was going to mention tea. And tea is something that I'm less experienced with. I've not been doing that for nearly as long as I have music, about a third of the time spent on tea. But that's what I'm doing with tea. So I, when I, I've got 
taste. Um, and that's the thing that makes the blends uh, attractive to people, I think, because I've got good taste. And I don't necessarily know always what I'm doing when I develop a blend, but I've just got good taste. And at some point, like, as I keep learning new stuff and I keep reading about it and kind of training, I'll internalize those new skills yeah. and make them routine and not have to think about them anymore. So that was all I was really interested in, 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 in really pointed to. I was going to ask you whether, like how much of a routine do you have when it comes to songwriting? Is there kind of a stable regularity to it or is it kind of uh, distinct from one time to another? Yeah. I mean, it tends to be, it's just ideas come in, all the time obviously as they will with you but it's whether you actually act on them which for a long time I wasn't doing and then now I'll still get ideas and then walk off and do something else because I don't until like I have the evening time I don't really have the opportunity to go away and you know look at something for three hours and try and make a song out of it but I try and make sure that from a routine point of view I go down to my little room a couple of times a week and just sit there and even if you come out with nothing and you just come out with you know, having explored an idea, which is more often than not, right? And I'm sure it's the same for you. Like you'll, of every 10 hours that you spend songwriting, quote unquote, you only come out with half an hour's worth of anything useful because you just mm. mess around and, and noodle. But I try and make sure that I put myself in a place where I can sit and I can do it and I can concertedly put effort into that and not have other distractions. Um, But sometimes it's completely fruitless because if, I think if that ties in with, an idea coming to you. And I've, I mean, I'm still, I think you've discussed this with other people as well. Like I've, I've no idea where ideas come from and why sometimes you'll have an incredible melody come to you. And other times you sat there like, why can't I remember what notes are anymore? And it's, it seems to be, there's no pattern to that. So sometimes I sit there and half an hour in, I'm like, yeah, this is not it. It's not here today. And other times it's great and songs fall out and you get a song done in two hours or whatever. Yeah. It's all, I partly, Part of the motivation, another part of the motivation, at least towards doing philosophy and to starting a tea company was because I was going through a period of writer's block, really, with music. And I was struggling to develop ideas and I was struggling to really access the ideas that I was having, which I'm sure I was still having them. I just couldn't grip, get a grip on them at all. So they were never really going anywhere. And as a result, I felt much less creative and so my kind of sideways, like I kind of made a lateral move there to just create something else instead. And I thought, well, do you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to limit myself to only creating music. Like I, you know, maybe part of why I feel so stressed by it is because I'm going through a bit of a dip with ideas because I've tried to do so much and I just need to take a break from it and do something else. And lo and behold, I did do that and it worked. Like I, I just... I guess I don't force it as much. One thing, one of the things that I remember from being in a band was that you would have rehearsals every week or so, and you would have rehearsals where they were just dud rehearsals, where nothing would really get done, and you would leave feeling like it was a waste of time. But I would leave, and then within moments of being in the car, would have all of my ideas about what we should do and when we should do it. Completely agree. <laughs> That's one of the things that I always found frustrating as well. And like as I knew I was coming towards this period of my life, like I don't want to bang on about it and I know I am, but when you have little people, you don't, you just don't have time. It's very difficult to like explain that if, if people don't and you know, you're not to know, but I can't just have my only musical time of the week or every two weeks in a room where that might happen, which I would have to do if I could sacrifice the time that I use now to make it into like a band situation where you go and you stand in a room and try and come up with ideas on the spot and blend them with other people's ideas and end up with a song after 12 hours of doing that where yeah. I feel like it can be more efficient. You know, you have more opportunity yeah. if you just do it and you can put the blocks together yourself for now. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I will want to be in a room with people again in the not too distant future. Like I'm in a period where time gets more and more and more free as, as the weeks go on for us. But, um, I, I mean, completely the same. I was nodding in agreement that you can't see, but, like you get in the car and then everything comes and the structure falls into place and you remember what bass part should go with that. And you're like, why the, why now? Yeah. It comes when you don't want it sometimes. Actually, that was the thing I liked about what you were saying is, is the, 
the importance of turning up, really. And it's if you're, I guess there's a question about luck as well. When people talk about, it's funny because I had this conversation yesterday with Dee um, about turning up. And a lot of the time when people talk about success in the arts, especially, is they, they kind of equate it with in music being signed to a record label or something equally mysterious. And when you think of it like that, or if you, if you think of what a successful musician is, you probably are more likely to think about somebody who's kind of in the upper echelons of their respective field, whoever that might be. Funny, for some reason, when I said that, Katy Perry sprung to mind, and I don't really know why. Yeah. Um, but there she is. But there she is anyway. And the thing about success, I think, is that it's some... There's a, there's a few sets of variables there that are important, and one of them's luck. So it's just chance, and you can't control that. But the things that you can control are regularity and like frequency and like turning up and doing things that you're supposed to do. So when it's if it's the case of songwriting, if you're writing a piece of music every week, well, then you're more likely to be there when luck is on your side. Um, when I was speaking about it with D, we said it was like it was like going for a bus. And not knowing what time the bus was going to turn up, but just going to the bus stop for 10 minutes and then leaving. Yeah, that's it. And it's like, you're you're more likely to get on the bus if you are at the bus stop when the bus is going to be there. And if you don't know when it's going to be there, regularly turning up to the bus stop in any case. And the second part of it being, well, that's still not enough because, you know, that would imply in musical terms that any old music is is good enough. But it's like having skills and having talent and developing those abilities is the same as having the right money to get on the bus yeah no it's, it works i've thought i've heard and not to not to bang on about him and them but i've heard noel gallagher discuss it as it's just like going fishing so he'll go and some days he won't catch anything but he shows up day after day and sometimes you know there's something to be caught and if he doesn't get it someone further down the line will and you know I don't know. That's I feel like that. Like sometimes, although I, I guess if somebody caught my ideas, they might make them a bit more, well, a bit better. I don't know. So maybe it's not that, but but you get the idea. Well, do you know, with that, with ideas, there was something that I, I made a note of and I wanted to, to come back to a couple of times throughout the conversation and we always seem to get away from it. So I'm going to bring it back to there now. Uh, you said that if somebody picked up some of the ideas that you had, they might be able to develop, develop it kind of in a better way than you. Yeah. Um, I, I, you're being self-deprecating and unfair on yourself, and I'm going to tell you off for that later. But I think the most disinteresting thing about every person is the stereotype about them, and the same with music. I think if you're lucky, that's the least interesting thing. And so in in, so in your case, it would be to say that uh, Rob Barraclough writes pop punk music. That is the least interesting thing about you and your music, what would make it more interesting is, is the truth of it. And this is what this conversation is trying to get to and what the podcast is trying to get to, which is what is your signature? What are the uh, what are the unique traits in your music that set you apart from other people? Because would they exist? Yeah. They surely exist. We Yeah, I'm sure they do. I don't I don't think they're unique features necessarily, but I, I appreciate what you mean by signature. I, I heard you talking about it with Storm on the last podcast. Like it's or the last podcast at the time we're talking, but um, I think I think writing authentic, if we're going to use the term pop punk, I think I'm not saying that we don't like. We play with a load of bands from like around us. There's a band from Leeds called Calls Landing who were very authentic and sounded like they meant it and all that stuff. But I think that's that's one thing that I always try and carry. Like I don't want to just write a song for the sake of it being some words. I, I hate when you like, like these days you can watch lyric videos for everything and when you watch it and you're like that co- line doesn't correlate whatsoever with that and it's not like they've come up with sort of nice phrases and things that mean something in isolation but might not tie together it's just things that don't mean anything and they just sort of they've thought well I need some words for this music so I'm gonna do anything and I think you know I try and always stray away from that I've, but I'm lucky aren't I because like well, in one way, like I'm not in a band that, or I'm not a musician that has any deadlines or anything ever. I appreciate that sometimes of a 12 track album, you're going to end up with some stuff that's, that's rushed. But I think that, I think I always try and be authentic. And 
Well, it was that thing of earlier, we used the analogy of software in like editing software in, in recording software and having different dials and toggles and bells and whistles on something and being able to pull it up and down. But that, that process that creates a, a unique shape, yeah. if you like, like a sonic shape or a, a quality. And I do think it's the same for people. Like you don't find two people are exactly the same. Everyone's got they're more in common with one another than they have different, but they're more different than they are the same in, in terms of like personality and their interests and their likes. There's a, there's a lot that we can see from our point of view that's different. And I think it's the same in, in the music that people produce as well. So I guess I'm gesturing at something there with genre and it's almost a little ironic that the way that we speak about music to each other is in terms of its least interesting features, like a genre. Yeah, it's like it's the it's the least detailed way of explaining what music a person produces. Do you think? And yet, that's what we rely on. Do you think that's because? And I'm not being pretentious, and I don't know the first thing in terms of, you know, obviously you studied. Um, did you study performance or what did you study at university music wise? It, it was, it began with music performance for yeah. like, it was a, it was a high national diploma. So it was, it was music performance with a, with a nod at recording really yeah. for about, I think I did two, two years of that. And then it was a top up degree. So the final year was recording. Yeah. A bit more focused. Cause I was going to say like, we, we probably do that. Cause it, it annoys me. Like, just in general, not talking about my music, but in general bands that I love and people are like, oh, well, that's an emo band because that's, you know, that's the music I grew up loving and still love a lot of it to this day. When it's like, are you, is that, that's how you're categorizing that. But obviously, you know, like I'll know like about a Taking Back Sunday record or whatever. I'll know what went into it because I've read all the interviews with Adam Lazara from that band or whatever. You'll know who the producer was. You'll have watched the videos when they were recording it. So you've got this kind of picture of what goes into the things that you love. So, and I think that's why you're, it's sometimes a bit reductive when people are talking about genres that you love, even using the genre name annoys people, which is such a strange thing. Cause how, I mean, you need some kind of broad category. The reason that I went onto your degree was we probably use those broad terms because most of the time when you're speaking to people, that's the level at which people can operate and people can have a conversation about it. If you start going into keys or, you know, using different EQs on different instruments or compression or, you know, Antares, Autotune, whatever, you'll just lose people. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily lose each other on that, but if you want me to talk about guitar sounds, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not today. <laughs> with, the, with the genre thing, though, I do see it more frequently now. This came up in a podcast with... Uh, my friend Harry Jackson as well. This is, a, I think, this podcast it's probably just being released actually yesterday. So, uh, so it was on the fourteenth of July that came out. But my conversation with him, we spoke about genre and how genre now seems to have factored in this distinction. And a lot of the time, when you see somebody self-identifying with a genre of music, it actually becomes a little bit convoluted and um, with you know hyphenated, over hyphenated, and it's just kind of this this like a three word yeah, yeah. story about what the genre is and it's like well that actually is not i mean in the example i'm referencing he they identified the band sunliner which is is the band harry's in at the moment as a cardigan punk which i thought was quite charming uh, yeah i've um, i've heard i've heard that i mean that's like the bands that i was talking about are like uh, that kind of thing the bands that i referenced earlier cardigan punk but anyway go on sorry <laughs> well i guess the only Thing I'm saying is I wonder if there'll be a change in the words that we're using and the genres, even though there's probably the same constants and, you know, you'll still have things like rock music as a very broad, yeah. big umbrella term for sub genre. But I wonder if these new sub genres will keep springing up and, and meaning something because the, the terms themselves don't really give much away. Like if you were to think cardigan punk, those two terms don't, they're fairly meaningless when it comes to music but it does evoke some vision. It evokes some kind of feeling to it. Just for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I think. Yeah. Go on. No, I was. I mean, it does. I mean, I know. So I know of Sunliner, so I can picture them anyway. But if not, I would be able to to picture them. Um. But I guess that's it. Like, maybe mine can be dad pop or something. I'll work more on that. <laughs> I'll work more on that. But. I think it's uh it's it's especially hard to do that when you're 
from your own angle as the creator of it, you're too emotionally invested in it to be objective about it and say, it's this word and that word. And that really captures everything. I think it's, that's a, that's a skill in and of itself. Um, which I haven't mastered. Well, I think sure. I think the other thing is most people are either too arrogant or too humble. So like I would be the, the the former. So I would be like, that doesn't quite capture it. That doesn't quite capture it. And then other people would be like, no, 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 no. I'm not that. You're being too kind. But yeah. um, Cardigan Punk is funny. It's not an easy one. <laughs> yeah. Listen, on on that note, we're we're well into it now. I'm I'm starting to feel like mentally I'm clocking out. So <laughs> Let's, this uh, is what I do to Let's people. leave it there. Yeah, no, this is what people do to me. I don't think it matters who it is. <laughs> Sorry. No, I like that you're honest. Uh, yeah, I don't mean it as an offense. I just, I'm an introverted person. I find it difficult to be, I find it de-energizing being around people for too long and I find it hard work. As much as I enjoy it, I, like I could have a conversation like this all day and but it's just, it takes too much. I appreciate that. From me. I appreciate that. There's no... Um... And I can't help but be honest. Well, <laughs> what, what honest. I was going to say is, along with my ability to accidentally offend a lot of people, luckily comes an ability to not really be offended by anything. So, you know. I I like that. It feels kind of, it's quite liberating. So I appreciate that too. Uh, where can people find your music? Um, well, obviously all the mainstreaming platforms, if you search my name, which is Rob Barrowclough, um, you'll be able to find my EP and a single, which I'll be releasing at the end of July. I assume this will be after that. So should be there. And on Instagram, that's the only dedicated platform I've got, which is at Rock Barrowclough Music. And yeah, you could find my Twitter. What's the name of the single? Uh, it's called What Do I Know? Which is a good cool. question. I'll, uh, I'll link all of that in the show notes for this as well. This has been an absolute pleasure ditto it was nice to catch up after a long time 